Joe Zuckerman is in the middle of the greatest concentration of COVID-19 cases in the world, and he, more than anyone, can speak authoritatively on how to get back to work in the midst of the pandemic. Joe, we are honored to have you here today, and we look forward to your comments. Uh, thank you very much, Robin. Uh, that sounded fairly dramatic there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, right, well, I'm in New York City at New York University uh, Langone Medical Center. And uh, as you know, New York City has had uh, a significant penetration of uh, these conditions. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this and let you know what we've been doing uh, for the last six weeks. So just to set the stage for NYU. So in orthopedics, but we each, each day normally, or we run about 28 to 30 operating rooms in which we provide orthopedic surgery. That consists of two inpatient facilities, but we also do ambulatory surgery, with two uh, standalone ambulatory surgery centers. So with that uh, in mind, we normally do about 20,000 plus operative cases a year. So that's what we were doing up until the beginning of March. And then things happened. March 15th, the uh, governor shut down elective surgery over the uh, following few days. And since that time, we've only done emergent and urgent orthopedic cases, averaging about five or six per day. Ambulatory surgery centers have been closed, but more importantly, all of our OR staff, our PACU staff have been deployed to inpatient units. Our residents and fellows, which number about 90, have also been redeployed, some covering orthopedics, but mostly redeployed to other areas. And we have a very large faculty of 150 orthopedic surgeons. Half of them have been deployed, deployed to assist in medical units, and the other half uh, who cannot participate in direct contact care have been doing non-contact tasks. So it's really been a all hands on deck type of thing. And our ability to care for these patients required that we move a lot of respiratory equipment, uh, ventilators that anesthesia machines were taken from the operating rooms and sent elsewhere so they could be utilized. And even though I work in an orthopedic specialty hospital, uh, the hospital is being used as a staging site for COVID positive patients in the later stages of, of their hospitalization so they could be moved from the main campus. So we currently have about 75 patients in our institution who, that we're cared for from a medical perspective. So over the last six, six weeks, this is what's happened at NYU where we have three hospitals, one in, in Manhattan, uh, one in Brooklyn and one in Long Island. So we've had over 4,800 admissions for COVID or COVID related conditions. That's almost a thousand ICU admissions. We've had unfortunately 800 mortalities and we've had over 3,800 discharges. Currently as of the midnight last night, we still have 672 inpatients with COVID-19, 244 of which are in ICUs and of those 209 remain intubated. So we're still even though we're on the downward side, we still have a significant patient burden to take care of. Now the finances as an institution uh, have been quite remarkable. When you shut down all the orthopedic surgery, that is a major, all the elective orthopedic surgery and elective surgery in general, that is a major financial impact. However, it had a double negative effect because all the patients were cared for, the reimbursements to an institution are far less than they would be for short-term procedural uh, cases. And caring for these patients have been uh, resulted in expenses that were much greater. And as, as astonishing as it may be, the marketplace has increased the cost of buying personal protective equipment, which only added to the losses. And frankly, this is a, a dramatic and unsustainable financial situation. And were it not for the government support, it would be even more, more uh, difficult. So now we're thinking about getting back to our core business. So to do that, every state is going to have their own criteria. New York is no different. And up until five minutes before this webinar, I was reviewing new criteria that the state has issued today. So we needed to have a sustained reduction in new cases, which we've had. And to restart again, every patient with COVID-19 symptoms uh, uh, have to have access to testing. We have, you have to have an institution that has at least 30% bed capacity. In other words, it can't be full and ICUs that have at least a 30% bed capacity. Some recent discussion at the state level may increase these to 50% numbers. So for us to start surgery again, the emphasis has to be on ambulatory surgery, so they don't require beds, addressing previously canceled cases, because those are the 
the most significant uh, patients to care for, uh, the more urgent cases, those with greater disability, focusing on healthy patients wherever possible, ASA 1 and 2s, and to minimize the potential need for ICUs. So as we, as we plan a modest restart in surgery, and for us a modest restart is in that 25 to 50% range, the government is gonna tell us what to do and they may change things uh, from day to day, you have to pay attention to that. But even if they say okay, there's a lot of things that we have to do. We have to return our staff to their primary responsibility. They have to be able to uh, undeploy from where they've been uh, deployed to care for medical patients. And all the equipment that I talked about that was shifted around, uh, all the respiratory equipment has to be returned to the operating rooms with appropriate cleaning. Uh, we have to continue to have sufficient personal protective equipment available for everyone, which fortunately we've been able to do. And the facilities have to go through not only a terminal cleaning, but a terminal COVID cleaning, which is a higher level than we would normally address because you have to be able to assure patients about the cleanliness uh, of the institution where you work. So uh, patient safety becomes the most important. All of our patients that are gonna undergo surgery uh, will be tested for COVID-19. Uh, COVID, uh, if they're positive, then the surgery, unless it's urgent uh, or emergent, will be postponed. A lot of our patients went through a pre-admission testing process, and which is still uh, appropriate. However, pre-admission testing may have to be repeated based upon the delay of the surgery, and we have that in place. All staff that would be caring for patients will also be tested. And since orthopedics relies to a certain degree on company representatives assisting, any company representative in the institution will also have to have proof that they've tested negative for COVID. And as you can imagine, the logistics of this are quite significant, right? Moving everybody around, uh, cleaning everything, moving equipment, moving people, it requires a, a very, very uh, integrated and coordinated approach across multiple domains. And you add to that the fact that we've got multiple institutions and you can see the complexity of it. And perceptions is also important. Uh, what we're finding as we contact patients who had previously scheduled surgery I would say in orthopedics, about 30% of those patients have decided to delay their surgery. Now that's in New York where, you know, it's, it's granted the epicenter of this, but 30% is about, and that will vary from, I'd say a lower percent for people undergoing outpatient elective surgery uh, uh, of the nature of sports medicine, to probably 50% of elderly patients uh, undergoing uh, joint replacement procedures. Well, we're planning as we enter this, and you notice I say week one and week two, I don't give a specific date for that because that's still in the process of being determined. Our hope is to open up at about 50% capacity of our operating rooms. You saw I mentioned we had run 28 to 30 a day. Realistically, we're probably gonna run about, about 10 to 12 rooms to start with. All patients and staff that are gonna be screened each day for temperature and symptoms. Anybody with any symptoms will not be allowed into the institution or patients will be advised not to come to the institution if that's the case. And although patients may be brought to the institution by a family member, a single family member, those family members will not be allowed in the institution. They can meet their, their friends or family uh, who undergo the surgery at the, uh, when they're ready to be discharged. We're trying to minimize the number of individuals in the, in the institution and certainly maintain social distances. Now, we're gonna reevaluate this on, a, on a, a virtually everyday basis to determine, right, if we're being successful, if it's working, and we fully expect that we're gonna to have to recalibrate as we, as we move through this. If things go well in the first two weeks, we would expect uh, to take two more weeks to get to 75% capacity, and then hopefully week five or six, we turn to full capacity. When I say capacity, I, uh, that may not necessarily mean 100% of what we were doing before, but 75% of what we of the patient load that requires surgery, we would hope that we can perform. So it's very much uncharted territory for us here in New York. And I would suggest that just as all politics is local, how you go about restarting surgery will be very much locally dependent upon the environment that you're in. So with that, I'm going to stop.